good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my talk is about human curiosity, hence the question mark. Uh, and I specifically talk about human curiosity and not so much about animal curiosity, even though animals are curious too. So uh, a few decades ago, a famous psychologist tried to map curiosity onto a two-dimensional plot like this, where one axis runs from perceptual curiosity to epistemic curiosity, and the other from diversive curiosity to specific curiosity. Now, what do I mean by each one of these? So let's start with perceptual curiosity. Perceptual curiosity is the curiosity you feel when you see something that surprises you, or something that doesn't quite agree with what you know, or at least think you know. I mean, think, for example, of uh, you know, these kids here, who for the very first time in their lives see a white young girl. You know, until this moment, they did not even know that such a thing exists. Look at their faces. That's the face of perceptual curiosity. Now, epistemic curiosity is the real love of knowledge, is what drives us to do scientific research, is what drives us to do the best works of art, it what drives education, it what drives storytelling, all of that. It drives us to ask why and how. For example, look at the faces of these children who are just examining how these plants grow and they want to know why they grow and how they grow. That's epistemic curiosity, wanting to know. Then on the other axis, I remind you, there was diversive curiosity. Diversive curiosity is what these kids here are doing. You see, these Dutch kids, they sit next to one of the greatest masterpieces of Western art. This is Rembrandt's The Night Watch at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. But what are they doing? They are looking at their cell phones. So that's the type of thing we do to avoid boredom and things like that, to check text messages and things like that. Now, oddly enough, the same painting, the very same painting, Rembrandt's The Night Watch, under different circumstances, generated a lot of perceptual curiosity, surprise. And I want to show you this. Now, don't be alarmed because you're going to hear an alarm sound. So here it goes. This is a Dutch shopping mall. This is inside the shopping mall. Look at the faces of the people who watch this. Here, look at that. So, what happened was that they restaged this painting because they reopened the Rijksmuseum after it has been closed for a while. So, you see, that's perceptual curiosity. Uh, sorry, yeah, in this case, perceptual. Now, the final thing was specific curiosity. Specific curiosity is when you're curious about a very specific thing, like um, who was it that wrote uh, The Old Man in the Sea or something, or who is the person in this picture? Does anybody know? That's Ernest Hemingway, uh, here in 1918 in Milan. So that's specific curiosity. Now, one of the things I've done in the book was to actually look at two of the people that I regard as some of the most curious people to have ever lived. One is Leonardo da Vinci, of course, whose last painting, by the way, just sold two days ago for $450 million, Salvatore Mundi. Leonardo da Vinci was not only a great artist, but he filled pages and pages with notes. They look something like this. And we have about 7,000 such pages. They were all written with his left hand from right to left, and in mirror image, so that to actually read it, you need to hold a mirror to the page. Now, you look at this page, and at first it looks like a collection of unrelated doodles. But if you look carefully, you start to see something there. You know, for example, you will start to study a certain phenomenon. 
like that wave of water up there. But then, you know, he's, in his mind, he would think, what does that remind me of? And then he would think of clouds or the hair of this old gentleman. And this is how his mind would go from one topic to the next. He was basically interested in everything except politics, uh, which was very wise of him because he lived at the time of the Borgias and the Borgias just killed everybody who was interested in politics. Uh, so, so this is Leonardo. And the next person is Richard Feynman, very, very famous physicist. But not only he worked on every area of physics, he also worked on, he was a bongo drummer. He was a, an expert on Mayan hieroglyphs, which is very relevant to Mexico. He was an expert in safe cracking. Uh, he studied how to draw. And you look at his notebooks, and they looked something like this. And you look at his notebooks, and you realize something very interesting. The mathematics is, of course, more sophisticated than that of Leonardo's. The drawings are less sophisticated than those of Leonardo's. But overall, the whole thing has the same feel. Let's now go to some theories of curiosity. So there is a theory that is called the information gap theory. What that theory says is, when are we curious and why? It says, when you look at something and it doesn't agree either with what you know or your biases, a gap is formed in your mind, and that gap is felt as, some, as an unpleasant state. And then your curiosity tries to bridge that, grab, that gap in order to get rid of that unpleasant state. That's the idea. Now, this clearly works for some forms of curiosity, like perceptual or specific. It doesn't quite agree with epistemic curiosity, that love of knowledge, because that we normally feel as a pleasurable state and not as, a, as a, an unpleasant state. Now, this theory also has with it this parabola curve, which basically says that when you know about something very, very little, you're not that curious about this, because you don't know what to be curious about. When you know about this a lot, you're also not very curious about this because you feel that you know almost everything there is to be known. When do you really get curious? It's when you know quite a bit already, but know or feel that there is much more to be known. That's in the middle of this curve. Now, strangely enough, a few years back, a former Secretary of Defense for the United States, Donald Rumsfeld, at a press conference, where he captured this graph, even though he was talking about something completely different. It was a press conference just before the Iraq war, and Rumsfeld was asked, what does he have to say about the fact that there is no evidence that is Iraq is transferring weapons of mass destruction to terrorist organizations? To answer that specific question, Rumsfeld said, It lost we the sound. Know there are known unknowns. That is to say, um, no, there are some things we do not know. Let me go back because, there are also because you lost. Unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. Sorry, I, he, they lost the sound for a second, so I, I want to go back for one second. So here it goes again. There are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. Now, this statement is completely logical, yes? Only as an answer to that particular question, it's a bit bizarre. And there is a British organization called the Foot in the Mouth that gives a, an award every year, and he got the award for that year for the, the most baffling statement by a politician. But you see, he did capture this curve because we're not very curious about the known knowns, not about the unknown unknowns. We are curious about only the known unknowns. Now, in addition to psychological studies of curiosity, there are neuroscientific studies of curiosity. What do they do? They take people and they stick them into MRI machines and they try to make them curious. For example, by showing them blurred images of objects, and they ask them what those are, and then they show them a clear image. What they found, that in this case, which is perceptual curiosity, that the area of the brain that is activated 
is actually the area that is associated with conflict or with hunger. So perceptual curiosity is indeed associated with an unpleasant state. On the other hand, when they did an experiment where they ask people questions, so they test epistemic curiosity, the love of knowledge. For example, you know, they would ask which musical instrument was invented to sound like a human voice. Now, you should know this by now because you just saw a performance. It's a violin. So, in any case, it, they found that the area of the brain activated in this case is actually an area associated with a pleasurable, with anticipation of reward. It's the type of feeling that you feel when you sit here and you wait for Ciudad de las Ideas to start. You know, anticipation of reward. So, indeed, perceptual curiosity and epistemic curiosity are associated with different feelings, both in terms of state of mind and in terms of the area of the brain that is being activated. Now, from everything I told you, you might have thought that in all times of history, curiosity should be encouraged, because it's so important for education, for this, for storytelling, for everything, for science. And yet, that's not what happened. For example, in 1937, the Nazis organized uh, the degenerate art exhibit in Munich, where they put all the modern artists on the wall because they wanted to convince the people that these are all Jewish Bolsheviks that uh, try to plan against the German people. The Taliban, for example, you know, they destroyed so these enormous Buddhas. Look at them. Those are those Buddhas. They dynamited them. These are hundreds of feet tall Buddhas from the 6th century and they dynamited them. This is an attempt to suppress curiosity. In the worst case, they attacked this young woman, Malala Yousafzai, because she dared to advocate for education for young Pakistani girls. They shot her in the head, and she, luckily she survived, went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize, and actually about four months ago was admitted to Oxford University. But these are all attempts to suppress curiosity. So while writing this book, I coined the phrase, curiosity is the best remedy for fear. And I strongly believe in that. You see, very often we are fearful of those things that we don't know much about or we don't understand. But by being curious about them and trying to learn more about them, we become much less afraid. One other thing I've done was to interview nine very, very uh, curious people who live today. And I'll just show you three of them here. Uh, so one is Fabiola Gianotti, uh, another is Brian May, and another is Vic Muniz. Just so that you know, Fabiola Gianotti, she's the director general of CERN, the Center for Nuclear Research near Geneva. She's one, led one of the teams that discovered the Higgs boson. Brian May is the person who looks most like Isaac Newton alive that I know but he's also the lead guitarist of the rock band Queen, but he's also a PhD in astrophysics, and he's a big, big advocate for animals. Vic Moon is, is this Brazilian artist who, who uh, recreates famous works of art from unusual things, like, you know, he can recreate the Mona Lisa from ketchup and diamonds, or something like this. So, let me then finish with first coming back to this person, Leonardo, one of the most curious minds to have ever lived, and one who said, both he and Feynman said, actually, it's interesting. Everything is interesting if you go into it deeply enough. But he also said, blinding ignorance does mislead us. Oh, wretched mortals, open your eyes. And finally, I'm a theoretical astrophysicist, my scientific idol, Albert Einstein, who just kept opening his eyes. Here he's opening them once, and twice, <laughs> and thrice. Thank you very much.